So I'll be telling you about fermion path integrals and topological phases. But before I get to my main topic, I'm going to start with a brief review and summary of some, some of what other people have said. So well, we've just been hearing today, actually, about SPT phases in Wen's talk. So in particular, we're learning that symmetry-protected topological phases of matter, in some sense, are associated to anomalies. So little d will be the space dimension, and big D will be space-time. So a d space-dimensional symmetry-protected topological phase is gapped in bulk. But although it's gapped in bulk, it's not quite trivial. It's actually described at long distances by what's called an invertible topological quantum field theory. So we could consider more general gap systems, but what, is, what Wen was describing as symmetry-protected topological would be ones that wouldn't have topological order if you ignore the symmetry. And that, in that case, the corresponding topological field theories are the so-called invertible ones. The, that means that the partition function z sub x on a closed manifold of dimension d plus 1, which I call capital D, is a complex number of modulus 1. And a lot of follows from this. First of all, you could always take an inverse theory, T inverse, whose partition function is Zx inverse. So the product of two, the two theories would have 1 for its partition function and would be completely trivial. Well, I, I should have reversed the order of A and B, but since I won't completely prove B, since I won't actually prove B at all today, uh, the order doesn't matter too much. But the other thing that follows from this fact is that on any spatial manifold M without boundary, so M is a little d-dimensional manifold, the space of physical states is one-dimensional. So it's a little, it's interesting and a little bit non-trivial to prove B, but A is more trivial because whatever we've done, if we find a theory that obeys the axioms of topological quantum field theory, its complex conjugate will also. But if z sub x is of modulus 1, the complex conjugate is the same as z sub x inverse. So A is a trivial statement, but B is less trivial. <coughs> so <coughs> a fractional quantum whole system is a typical system where B fails. Actually, I explained this a little bit in my last lecture Friday, last week. So, for a fractional quantum whole system, the space of physical states on a compact manifold has dimension bigger than one. So that's more deeply non-trivial than an SPT phase. SPT phases are almost trivial. They would become trivial if you forget the symmetry. And on a compact manifold, they would always have a one-dimensional space of ground states, just like a completely trivial gap system. But so what is non-trivial about an SPT phase? Or what makes it really interesting? So, OK. If I tell you that uh, there's some crazy gap system whose partition function on some peculiar four manifold is the a cube root of 1, or sorry, a cube root of minus 1, that might be entertaining. But how would you really get potentially observable physics out of it? What makes such a theory non-trivial is that on a D manifold with boundary, it's hard to make sense of its partition function. So the partition function is z sub x is a topological invariant that usually has a fairly concrete definition, but the definition doesn't really work on a manifold with boundary. To be more precise, you can't define z sub x on a manifold with boundary in a physically sensible way without adding some new degrees of freedom on the boundary of x. Now, in my lecture today, the new degrees of freedom will be free fermions. Actually, I wrote usually, but it's always, because I realize I wouldn't have time to talk about anything else. But in general, there are additional and more subtle possibilities. Uh, Charlie Kane, in his last lecture last week, gave a very brief introduction to the possibility that the boundary is gapless and topologically ordered. If we're given a bulk theory, so this is a bulk theory that has trouble on a manifold with boundary. So there has to be something on the boundary to solve the trouble. But what there is on the boundary is not uniquely determined. The reason is that given any consistent construction, we could always add on the boundary a completely consistent d-dimensional theory S. So if we have anything that makes sense, we could always, well, literally glue on to the boundary of our material anything else. 
some other consistent system, and we get something else. The very fact that S is consistent by itself means it can be added to any consistent theory without spoiling the consistency. But if this was the only ambiguity, it would seem a little bit uninteresting because there might seem to be a minimal boundary theory where we didn't add S. What makes it interesting is that, in general, there's no minimal boundary theory, and the reason is that there's a second operation. After, if you have a consistent theory, you might be able to add to the Hamiltonian a relevant operator, possibly coupling what we added in S to what we already had and removing some degrees of freedom. Removing them makes, means making them become gapped so they're no longer part of the long-distance description. So, very schematically, there are two basic operations that connect the possible boundary states of a given SPT phase, which I'm calling curly T. A relevant perturbation brings us down, gapping possibly some degrees of freedom. We can go up by adding something, and we're only interested in the gapless stuff we add, but we can add some gapless stuff as long as it's a consistent little d-dimensional theory. But then we can make a relevant perturbation again, and then we can go back up. So <clears throat> this, uh, you might think of a locally minimal, okay, what would you expect to find in the real world? Well, in the real world, you'd expect to find something locally minimal in the sense that there isn't any perturbation that would gap anything you've got, but there might be more than one locally minimal thing. This might be a universality class of a boundary system in the real world, but this might be too. You can't get from here to here by adding a relevant perturbation, but you could get it possibly by adding another layer of atoms on the boundary and then letting nature make a relevant perturbation. So there might be different universality classes of what can exist on the boundary, which correspond to locally minimal things. When you go up and down, you're going up, down as much as you can, but maybe if you went up, you'd be able to then get over the hill. <clears throat> so a given SPT phase in D dimensions has a lot of possible boundary states in general. But they have something in common. What they have in common is that they are not completely consistent or do not have the expected symmetries by themselves. If they were completely consistent, they would have been what I called S. We wouldn't have needed them. So, <clears throat> the, whatever there is on the boundary has the property that it's consistent and symmetry preserving, not by itself, but in, in conjunction with the bulk theory T. So, the theory T had some kind of problem on its boundary, and we will have examples in the rest of the lecture, and the boundary degrees of freedom that fix it are something that is consistent and symmetry preserving together with T. But if the boundary degrees of freedom were consistent and symmetry preserving by themselves, they wouldn't help. T had a problem, so we have to cancel it by something that has an equal, equal and opposite problem. So in some sense, the boundary theory of an SPT phase is anomalous, with the anomaly being measured precisely by the bulk theory T. <clears throat> so this qualitative picture is relatively well established, and it's what uh, Wen was starting to explain today, first with his example, uh, with the Z2 symmetry in two dimensions, and then with the abstract theory he was developing at the end of his lecture. But although the qualitative picture is relatively well established, some of the most, for some of the most basic SPT phases, it's not completely well understood what this philosophy means. And here I have in mind the examples that we heard about last week in Kane's lectures that can be constructed from free fermions using band theory and whose boundary state consists of D minus one dimensional gapless fermions of some kind. So in some cases, the philosophy is completely understood. So uh, w this is general enough that we could be talking about a quantum Hulse system, and then there is an anomaly involving the Chern-Simons coupling of, of what I called big A last week, the electromagnetic potential, and the boundary degrees of freedom cancel the anomaly of that. So that's an example of a free fermion SPT phase where this philosophy is completely understood. But uh, for the ones that, for the more recent ones, the ones where time reversal is important, it's perhaps less understood, and that's what I will explain today. So the precise sense in which the boundary fermions in these theories is anomalous 
is rather subtle and hasn't been fully described. And I will aim to do that today, focusing for my examples on topological insulators and superconductors in two or three dimensions. So to do this, we'll have to describe anomalies in fermion path integrals in more detail than is usually done. <coughs> in doing this, I'll focus on three examples which correspond to the three broad classes of fermion theories. The three classes are distinguished by how the fermions transform under the symmetry group. By the symmetry group, I mean, first of all, the rotation group in Euclidean signature, so I should say, a deficiency of this lecture for condensed matter physics is that we'll study this as a relativistic phenomenon. And as a condensed matter physicist, you should worry to what extent the lessons are applicable. But we'll have enough trouble in our hands just to describe the relativistic story. So that's what I'll do today. So in D dimensions, the symmetry group will include the rotation group, which is in Euclidean signature SOD. But since we have fermions, it's really spin D. And then if time reversal or reflection symmetries are important, we include those in the symmetry group, and there may also be gauge or global symmetries. For example, for the topological insulator, U1 of electromagnetism is certainly important, as well as time reversal symmetry. Now, schematically, I write K for the full symmetry group. So for today's point of view, there are three broad classes of theory depending on whether fermions transform in a pseudo-real, real, or complex representation of K. Of course, this is an idealization because we could have mixtures, although in the basic examples of free fermion states of matter, we don't have mixtures. But in general, you could have mixtures in which some fermions transform in one representation and some in the other. So the theories I'll use to illustrate these possibilities are the following. For type 1, my basic example will be a 3D topological insulator or superconductor where we consider only orientable spacetimes. My example of type 2 will be a 2D time reversal conserving topological insulator. I forgot to write time reversal conserving here. And my example of type 3 will be a 3D topological superconductor or insulator where we now consider possibly unorientable spacetimes. <coughs> So examples one and three are the same, just differing by whether we consider what happens when space-time is not orientable. Now, it'll be clear in the lecture that cases one and two are more elementary, and the topological invariance we have to use to understand these cases may be more familiar, well, at least in case one, perhaps less so in case two. Case three, in a sense, is universal. If you understand case three, then cases one and two are trivial special cases. But if I actually presented it that way by first explaining case three, you would probably find it a little bit mystifying. So I don't want to start with case three, even though it's the universal case, because you will understand better what to expect if you understand the more simple special cases first. Now, instead of saying that the fermions transform in a pseudo-real, real or complex representation of the gauge group, I can make the following equivalent statement, which is closer to what we actually need physically. A pseudo, see, a pseudo real represent, well, a bare mass is supposed to be bilinear in the fermions. And a pseudo real representation is one that has an anti symmetric invariant, but by Fermi statistics, a mass term is supposed to be anti symmetric. So, case one is the case that a bare mass is possible for all fermions that's invariant under the connected part of the symmetry group K, but it might violate a discrete symmetry such as time reversal. So for our purposes, case one means that the fermions can have a bare mass if you ignore time reversal symmetry. Only time reversal will pre prevent the, um, the bare mass. That means if you double the spectrum, which would enable you to get away from the constraints of Fermi statistics, because a mass term could relate one fermion to a different one, rather than relating a fermion to itself, you could have a symmetry-preserving bare mass. Case two is the case that even at the cost of violating time reversal, you can't have a fermion bare mass unless you double the spectrum. So in cases one and two, you could have 
But if you want to preserve time reversal, you have to double the spectrum. But in case one, if you're willing to break time reversal symmetry, you can get a bare mass without doubling the spectrum. Finally, case three is the case where no amount of doubling the spectrum will help. So case three means that the rotation symmetry or the gauge symmetry prevents a bare mass. The bare mass is not just prevented by discrete symmetries. So my first example will be case one. So that'll be the three-dimensional topological insulator, which is a T-invariant system that has on its boundary a two plus one dimensional massless Dirac fermion. So this is the boundary action. And it couples to electromagnetism with the same charge as the electron. In fact, in band theory, psi is simply a particular mode of the electron. It's two components. So, <coughs> right. It's the minimal thing you can have in two plus one dimensions, um, which is a two component Dirac fermion. So, the reason psi is massless is that a mass term would violate T symmetry. Now, uh, I'll explain why in a second. But you see, as long as we're working on orientable manifolds only, we can forget T-symmetry if we want to. So that's why in the first part of my lecture, we will only be on orientable manifolds and T will be optional. We can violate it when we feel like it and then we'll restore it. At the end, we'll get back to the more subtle case of an unorientable manifold where the whole construction is only possible because of T invariance. So then we will not have the option of forgetting T-symmetry. Just to remind you why a bare mass would violate time reversal, I explained why last time. You could add a Lorentz invariant bare mass in the Dirac equation, and it would then describe a single spin state. It's actually a single spin state because of what Wen said, that psi has two components. The number of spin states is half the number of components of psi, and in two plus one dimensions, psi has two components. So there's one spin state that would have mass absolute value of m, but its spin would be one half the sine of m. And since time reversal changes the sign of the spin, either sign of m would be T violating. So our boundary fermion here could have a mass, but that mass is T violating. That's actually important in real studies of this system because um, experimentally you can violate T by applying a magnetic field or maybe bringing in uh, magnetic impurities on the surface. And then the surface does become gapped and that's part of what's studied experimentally. So for many reasons, of which some will be clear later in my lecture, it's extremely important that you could have a bare mass if you were willing to violate T. There are two different charges. Particles of charge plus one and charges of particles of charge minus one. <coughs> yes. And um, so th this theory also has charge conjugation. So, so, yeah, so first of all, as a result of the fact that there, there would be two spin states, there are two spin states of two different charges. And if you would ignore U1 symmetry, then you could combine them together. Say, it would be possible, okay. this mass term is charge conserving and gives the same spin to both charge one and charge minus one states. But if you were willing to use a charge violating mass term, which would be appropriate if you, for example, bring this system in contact with an ordinary superconductor so that charge is violated, then a Dirac fermion would be the same as two Majorana fermions. And you could have a T conserving but charge violating mass term for this system. But that's not what we're going to do today. Everything will be, when I discuss the topological insulator, we will always conserve charge and then it's true that time reversal prevents a bare mass. But moreover, however, time reversal is the only thing that prevents a bare mass. So if we find a T-invariant material that has a single massless Dirac-like mode on its boundary in a charge-conserving system, then this state of affairs is protected by time reversal symmetry. By contrast, if there are two such modes, psi and psi prime, T would allow mass terms of equal magnitude and opposite signs for the two modes with T symmetry exchanging them. 
So in two plus one dimensions, there are two kinds of T invariant insulators. Those that have an even number of massless fermions on the boundary, but then generically there will be none after making the most general relevant perturbation, which nature will usually have done for you. And then there are the ones that have an odd number, which after the generic perturbation is one. And those are, these two classes are the, <coughs> well, the first kind is generically gapped in both bulk and boundary, and it's called a trivial insulator. The second kind is called the topological insulator. It's ungapped on the boundary as long as we maintain time reversal symmetry and, uh, and electric charge conservation. And that's the case we're going to study. And as I said, we'll initially study it on orientable manifolds only. Now, we're going to study the partition function z sub psi of the psi field on a possibly curved three manifold M. Coupled to a background electromagnetic potential A, and also, of course, to the Riemannian metric of M, whatever that might be. Formally, the partition function is the determinant of the Dirac operator. So Z psi is supposed to be the determinant of the Dirac operator. Curly D is the Dirac operator defined in the usual way. So mu runs over three space-time dimensions, zero corresponds to the time, one and two are space. The Dirac operator is Hermitian, so its eigenvalues are real. And formally, the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. <coughs> now, if we had two Dirac fermions, we'd be interested in the square of what I just wrote. And then this is the product of a lot of positive numbers. So we would expect, and this would be the right answer rigorously even, that the z psi squared would be positive. And of course, this product is divergent, it needs some regularization. And for example, pauli velars regularization is obtained by adding a scalar with a large bare mass. It has a very large bare mass, so, um, so I've written the denominator, but shifted with a large bare mass. So, <coughs> well, pauli velars regularization improves this divergent factor by first of all adding the regulator and then making a few more steps, which I actually will explain a little bit in a moment. But, so the full procedure is more elaborate. But anyway, the point is that adding a regulator field, if we had two um, Dirac fermions, preserves all symmetries and enables one to show that the theory of two Dirac fermions is completely consistent and symmetry preserving. That's not unrelated to the fact that it can be gapped. In general, anomalies always have to do with things that you can see at long distances. So the fact that the two, the case of two Dirac fermions can be gapped in a symmetry preserving fa fashion is not unrelated to the fact that it can be regularized and is completely consistent. With one Dirac fermion, we have a bit of a problem because Z psi is naturally real but not naturally positive. All the factors are real, so it's reasonable to claim that Z psi should be real, but there's no natural way to define its sign. So it's reasonable, I should say, at first sight to claim that Z psi is real, but you'll see that the claim that Z psi is real actually will lead to a contradiction. And we will learn eventually that the theory cannot be consistently quantized with Z psi required to be real. But as a, your first thought would be to claim that Z psi is real. But you can see that there is no natural way to define its sign. Because to define its sign, well, the sign is the number of lambdas that are negative, mod two, but there are infinitely many <laughs> negative lambdas and they're not paired in any interesting way. And there's no obvious way to decide if the number of negative lambdas is even or odd. Now, you could pick a particular metric and gauge field. Let's say G equals G zero and A equals A zero. And then you could pick the sign of Z psi when the gauge field and metric are whatever you picked. And having done so, let's say you decide it's positive there. Then if you want to know what the sign is somewhere else, you follow it continuously, saying that it changes sign whenever an eigenvalue passes through zero. <clears throat> the trouble is if we do this, we run into a contradiction. So the contradiction arises as follows. 
And I'm going to now explain to you the idea behind global anomalies. Although we kind of did it uh, a week ago today when I was talking about the integer quantum Hall effect. Let phi be a gauge transformation or a combination of a gauge transformation and a diffeomorphism. And let A0 phi and G0 phi be whatever A0 and phi 0 transform into under phi. <coughs> it's always possible to continuously interpolate from any one metric and gauge field to any other. The way you do this is embarrassingly simple. You literally introduce a real parameter S that runs from 0 to 1, and you write this stupid formula where both G and A vary linearly with S, so that at S equals 0, they start at the given starting point, and at S equals 1, you end at the given end point. We have to make sure that this interpolation makes sense. For A, there's nothing we have to check because there aren't any inequalities that A is supposed to obey. G is supposed to be positive, but I've taken a linear combination of positive matrices with positive coefficients. So I haven't done anything bad for G either. So this interpolation always makes sense. So we can evolve A and G continuously in sign from 0 to 1, and we can count how many times the partition function changes sign. We'd like the number of sign changes to be even, so that the sign of the partition function will be the same at s equals 1 as it was at s equals 0. We want that because phi, by definition, was a gauge transformation. So if the partition function is gauge invariant, it should have the same sign at s equals 1 that it had at s equals 0. If the partition function changes sign an odd number of times as a function of s, that's called an anomaly. <coughs> it's possible to have such an anomaly because when s is varied from 0 to 1, the spectrum of the Dirac operator can undergo a non-trivial spectral flow. I've tried to draw it in this picture where lambda runs vertically, and the horizontal line represents lambda equals 0, and s runs horizontally. So here's the spectrum at s equals 0. Here's the spectrum at s equals 1. The spectrum at s equals 1 is the same as the spectrum at s equals 0, because in going from s equals 0 to s equals 1, we simply made a gauge transformation. But there could be a non-trivial spectral flow, as I've drawn, where each eigenvalue moved up by 1 when we went from s equals 0 to s equals 1. So in this picture, there was one change of sign between s equals 0 and s equals 1 when one eigenvalue passes through 0. And when this happens, that means that our theory, if we try to define the partition function to be real, is anomalous. It can't be defined in a gauge invariant fashion because it changed sign between s equals 0 and s equals 1. As I've written, this can only happen because D has infinitely many positive and negative eigenvalues. A matrix with only, f uh, clearly in this picture, the eigenvalues are flowing in from minus infinity and flowing out to plus infinity. They're all moving upwards by 1. In the particular case of boundary fermions of the 3D topological insulator, there definitely is such an inconsistency in the sign of the determinant, which therefore cannot be defined as a real number. <clears throat> now, sorry. Okay. Now, this is called an anomaly in time reversal symmetry because time reversal implies that the partition function should be real. So what we've discovered so far is that the 3D Dirac fermion cannot be quantized in a time reversal invariant fashion. Now, I'll get back to what we can do in a second, but there's a technical comment I want to make here, which is, even if we had not run into a contradiction, we would not be out of the woods. The absence of an anomaly in the sign of the determinant means that on a particular M, the sign is well-defined as a function of A and G up to an overall sign that depends on M but not on A and G. See, in, the, in setting it up, to ask whether there was a global anomaly, we picked a some sign at A0 and G0, and we didn't know what to pick. 
So we ran into no inconsistency, but we also didn't determine the overall answer. We had an arbitrary choice of sign that depended on M, but not on A and G, in setting that up. But we should not expect to get a sensible physical theory if we define the sign of the determinant independently for each M. Physically, there must be a sensible behavior under various cutting and pasting operations in which, in which various three man volts MI are cut in pieces and glued together in different ways. In examples relevant to topological states of matter, a good example being the 3D topological superconductor with nu equals eight. Even if there is no anomaly in the traditional sense I've explained, there can be an inconsistency of a more subtle kind. There can be an anomaly in the sense there's no satisfactory way to define overall signs or phases of the path integral on different m's. So on any one m, you don't see any contradiction, but there is a contradiction when you compare different m's. <clears throat> so you have to take these more subtle anomalies into account as part of the paradigm that anomalies in d minus one dimensions correspond to SPT phases in d dimensions. Taking these more subtle anomalies into account means trying to give an absolute definition of the phase of the path integral for each m. We want to define the path integral not up to a phase that was picked at random at the starting point a0 and g0, but we want to have a better definition that will tell us exactly how to define the path integral on any m and for any a, any g and a. So that's what we'll aim to do. We'll aim to get a more precise answer than just analyzing anomalies in the traditional sense. Now, going back to the two plus one dimensional charge Dirac fermion, the fact that there's a problem in defining the sign doesn't mean that the theory is inconsistent. It just means that it violates time reversal symmetry and also reflection symmetry. So after all, as I've told you, psi could have had a gauge invariant bare mass which violates T and R symmetry, but otherwise is perfectly physically acceptable. So since the theory could have been gapped at the cost of violating T and R, that really ought to mean that it's a consistent quantum field theory as long as you don't ask it to preserve T and R symmetry, but otherwise it should obey all axioms of quantum field theory. Now, <clears throat> but we'll actually proceed as follows. At the because a bare mass is possible, there could have been a Pauli-Vilar's regulator field, chi, that would have a bare mass. We'll think of it as a bosonic field that would have obeyed a massive Dirac equation. And we pick an M. We want the regulator to have a large mass, but either choice of the sign of mass is T or R violating. So we're regulating this theory in a way that violates T and R symmetry, and we will not get those symmetries back in the limit. So we will get a consistent quantum field theory, but not one that preserves T and R symmetry. So roughly speaking, in Euclidean signature, the regularized version of the path integral is the product of lambda over lambda plus I M. So had we had two of these fermions, it would be lambda squared over lambda squared plus M squared. You could think of that as coming from having one regulator with positive M and one with negative M. Then that would be positive and would lead to no trouble. But with one, this has a phase that we'll have to analyze. Now, I was of two minds about whether I should hope you were satisfied with this characterization of pali regularization, or you wanted a more complete answer. So I wrote the more complete answer in parentheses there, but I didn't want to explain it too much. So pali regularization is a longer procedure that starts with this. And there's a bunch of steps that I summarized here. But, <coughs> All those steps are important in getting a complete answer, but they're not important for what we'll say about the phase of the answer. So I will not explain what's written in parentheses, but it's in the slides if you want to think about it later. For us, we're only concerned with the phase of the path integral. The absolute value can always be defined in a consistent way. In fact, that's a universal statement about fermions in any dimension. The fermion path integral always has a well-defined absolute value. Any anomalies only involve its phase. Now, here was our formal expression for the partition function. So what is its phase? Well, you see, 
if m is positive, if m is very large, then each eigenvalue contributes i inverse or i to the phase, depending on the sign of lambda. So formally, the phase is what I've written here, e to the minus i pi over 2 times the sum over all eigenvalues of the sine of lambda. So the phase of the partition function is e to the minus i pi over 2 times a regularized version of the difference between the number of positive and negative eigenvalues of the Dirac operator. That regularized version is called the atiyah patodi singer eta invariant. And more or less any regulator gives the same answer. So what it means to regularize is that in the sum over i, you include a cutoff function that's 1 for small eigenvalues and 0 for large eigenvalues and goes smoothly from 1 to 0. And you don't want the cutoff to violate time reversal explicitly, so the cutoff function is an even function of lambda. So you need to regularize this expression, but any reasonable regularization gives the same answer. The orig original regularization of A, P, and S was this one, but you can do something else if you like it better. So this formula, that the partition function is its absolute value, which is well-defined, times e to the minus i pi eta over 2, together with any standard definition of z psi, gives a satisfactory definition of the partition function of a 3D Dirac fermion on any m for any a and g, with all desirable physical properties except time reversal and reflection symmetry. So we've done much more than proving the theory is anomaly free. We've given an absolute formula for the partition function on any manifold. It's the partition function of a gapless theory. So it's not the exponential of a local function. The absolute value of, of z is extremely non-local and the phase is slightly non-local. But they have no reason to be local because what we were writing is the partition function of a gapless theory. <coughs> the failure of T and R symmetry is often called a parity anomaly. The charged 3D Dirac fermion can be quantized, but not in a T and R invariant way. The quantization gives a gapless quantum field theory that's perfectly unitary and Poincaré invariant. It's even conformally invariant. It conserves electric charge. The only good property it doesn't have is time reversal and reflection symmetry. So there are a lot of interesting things you could say about the fact that this formula is physically sensible, but uh, I decided I would limit myself to saying one thing about it in view of the, the fact that there's more th things to cover today. When an eigenvalue of the Dirac operator passes through zero, the fermion path integral is supposed to change sign. So that was a property of the formal definition of the product of eigenvalues. And <clears throat> regularization should not change that fact. So part of the physics is the partition function being multiplied by minus 1 when an eigenvalue passes through 0. Well, let's just check it's true. Of course, there's no sign change in the absolute value, but eta is defined in such a way that it jumps by 2 when an eigenvalue passes through 0, giving the desired sign change. So the partition function is not real because it doesn't preserve time reversal, but it changes sign. Maybe changing sign is the wrong expression. It multiplies by minus 1 whenever it should. And we could say a lot more things about this, but basically it's a completely physically sensible answer. <clears throat> now changing the sign of the regulator mass would have complex conjugated the partition function, so perhaps I should better write the partition function like this, where the sign depends on the choice of regulator. Now, in the theory of the 3 plus 1 dimensional topological insulator, it's shown that on the surface of such a material, there is the 2 plus 1 dimensional Dirac fermion that we've been discussing. And as I've explained, that is a physically sensible system, but not a T-conserving one. But the topological insulator is T-conserving. The 2 plus 1 dimensional Dirac fermion is not supposed to be T conserving by itself, but the combination of the bulk physics of the topological insulator with the boundary Dirac fermion is claimed to be T conserving. So let's discuss the bulk physics a little bit. 
In vacuum, we describe the electromagnetic field by the Maxwell action, which is basically E squared minus B squared, E and B being electric and magnetic fields. In the presence of a material, all sorts of additional interactions may be induced, such as interactions that are associated to um, the dielectric constant of the material and numerous others. For our present purposes, purposes, the important interaction is the theta term, where P is, well, it can be written in non-relativistic language as the electric field dotted into the magnetic field. I've written it more relativistically. P is called the instanton number because on a compact four manifold X without boundary, it's a topological invariant, in fact, an integer. The term you add to the action, however, is not P, rather it's a multiple of P, where the, what multiplies P is usually called theta and called the theta angle. So I sub theta is the part of the action proportional to P, and I write it simply as theta times P. Now, you might not immediately know how to make a, in U1 gauge theory, a field with non-zero P, so although I won't give a big explanation, I'll just make a very brief statement. You could take X to be S2 times S2 and put one quantum of magnetic flux on each S2 factor. That would give a gauge field with P equals one. Because P is always an integer, and in quantum mechanics we only care about the value of the action mod two pi times an integer, theta is an angle, usually called the theta angle. Well, there's a subtlety which sort of is similar to what Wen was telling us today. P is always an integer on a manifold without boundary. But we can't be so cavalier when there's a boundary, and that's what we'll be talking about for the next 10 minutes, roughly. In the context of condensed matter physics in a gap system, the effect of action for the electromagnetic field, in general, is an arbitrary linear combination of all possible gauge invariant interactions, only constrained by symmetries. So in particular, we should expect the theta term to be present in the effect of action whenever symmetries allow this. What symmetries would forbid I theta? Well, I theta is odd under time reversal or reflection symmetry. So in a theory with neither T nor R symmetry, you should expect theta to appear with a completely generic coefficient. <coughs> so in condensed matter, the materials with theta equals zero should only be those materials that are T or R conserving. <coughs> what if T or R is a symmetry? Well, T or R change the sign of theta, so naively they would force theta to be zero. But since theta is equivalent to theta plus two pi, there are really two different T and R conserving values of theta, namely zero and pi. It's been shown that the 3D topological insulator is a T conserving material with theta equals pi. So we haven't had the fun of observing the theta angle in the strong interactions because the neutron electric dipole moment has defied detection but we've observed the theta angle of electromagnetism inside a topological insulator. Now, before specializing to the T-conserving case, let's discuss the generic case with any theta, and to begin with, assume the boundary is gapped. So here's a material. M is the, M is the world volume, the vertical direction is time. So M is the boundary, including time, and X is the world volume of the bulk of the material. And I'm assuming theta is zero in the vacuum, but theta is non-zero inside the material. <coughs> now, I'm about to say something for which topology is not important. So we can be naive, and if we're a little bit naive, we can write P in terms of the vector potential rather than in terms of the curvature, F mu nu, and as such, it's a total derivative. But we're on a manifold with boundaries, so the total derivative doesn't integrate to zero. It integrates to a Chern-Simons coupling on the boundary, where I used Stokes' theorem in the last step to integrate by parts. The right-hand side is something we discussed last week, and other speakers have this week. 
It's the churn simons action for A divided by 2 pi, where churn simons is the 2 plus 1 dimensional interaction that we discussed last week. And therefore, I theta, which was just theta times P, is the same as theta over 2 pi times churn simons of A. Or more exactly, this is a true statement in a topologically trivial situation where our manipulation is valid. Last week, we considered churn simons as a possible interaction in a purely 2D material, and we learned that its coefficient has to be an integer k, which moreover determines the whole conductivity of a gap system without topological order. In the present context, we're not considering an abstract 2D material, but the surface of a 3D material. We've just learned that in that context, there's no reason for k to be quantized. Instead, the effective value of k, which is theta over 2 pi, is never an integer, except in the uninteresting case that theta is 0 mod 2 pi times an integer. So we can view this as a particularly elementary example of how the boundary of a 3D system can have a property that's impossible for a purely 2D system. The only trouble with this is that it's very hard to measure Hall transport when the sample doesn't have a boundary. So standard observations of the quantum Hall effect have 2D samples that have boundaries, and then leads are attached to the boundaries and current flows and so on. But uh, the boundary of a boundary, sorry, a boundary does not have a boundary. So although this is a clear theoretical prediction for a generic condensed matter system, it's very hard to test because of the fact that since the boundary lacks itself a boundary, conventional observations of Hall currents aren't going to work. <coughs> okay, so much for that, and now let's go back to the T or R conserving case. <coughs> We're expecting or hoping that theta equals pi will be T and R invariant, but there's a problem. I just computed for you that the Hall conductivity is theta over 2 pi. So if theta is pi, the Hall conductivity is a half, and if theta is minus pi, the Hall conductivity is minus a half. This assuming that the boundary is gapped. Neither of these values is T or R invariant. Well, you have to be very careful about the meaning of the claim that theta equals pi is T or R invariant in the case that X has a boundary, which is the only real case in condensed matter physics because we don't study samples that go off to infinity. The claim means that the bulk physics is T and R invariant, and that these symmetries can be maintained by a suitable boundary state. But a trivial gap boundary state is not suitable, as we've seen. A trivial gap boundary state leads to a whole conductivity that's going to be half or minus half, either of which violates T symmetry. There has to be instead something on the boundary. <coughs> so to say again what I've just said, <coughs> theta equals plus or minus pi means that in the path integral measure, there's a factor e to the plus or minus i pi times the instanton number. And here I've written that factor in more detail. Well, <coughs> t and r say that the path integral measure should be real, and that's okay when p is an integer. But as soon as you're on a manifold with boundary, the integral defining p is not an integer anymore. And these expressions, first of all, are not real, so they violate T and R symmetry. And secondly, by the same token, they depend on the sign. So the two cases where theta is pi and theta is minus pi are different. <coughs> so if we do nothing but include this factor in the path integral measure, we'll get a whole conductivity on the surface with an effective k of plus or minus a half. Not a t-conserving system. As I keep telling you, t or r symmetry imply the path integral measure should be real in Euclidean signature, but not necessarily positive, and the factor I've written does not have that property. So a boundary, sorry, a t-conserving boundary state is going to be something more interesting than the trivial gap state we implicitly assumed in merely writing this factor with nothing else on the boundary. The simple boundary state of the topological insulator 
has gapless Dirac fermions on the boundary. And as I've explained, they have a T and R anomaly. In fact, we explained that their partition function is, the app, is something positive times this fun E phase involving the eta invariant. Now, this factor is not T or R invariant, just as the bulk factor is not. But it turns out that if you add to P a certain gravitational correction that I'll just call A hat of R, R being the Riemann tensor, the combination of these factors is real and thus T and R are conserving. In fact, there's a famous formula of Atiyah, Patodi, and Singer that says that this factor times the one that comes from the instanton number with the gravitational correction is plus or minus one. It's minus one to the iota, where iota is an integer. <clears throat> so I'll explain that formula, or at least a little bit, in a while. But for now, let me just say that it means that the complete path integral measure after integrating at boundary fermions is this times the corrected factor involving theta, which is this. And the product of the two is something positive times minus one to the iota. So that's real. So actually, Viktor Mikhailov and I ran into this formula in a recent, recently in a problem involving D-brains in the string theory. Iota? I'll explain it in a bit. So postponing for a moment an explanation of the APS formula, let me just try to convey an idea of why this is a sensible answer for the path integral. So I, I've already observed that it's T conserving. Uh, another aspect of being sensible is that it's consistent with unitarity, which uh, unfortunately I won't take the time to explain. But I want to explain in what sense theta equals pi inside the material and theta is zero outside. What particle physicists call an instanton is a localized field with P equals one. And since uh, I will talk about instantons for a little bit, I want to uh, explain how, at least in a thought experiment, we could imagine having instantons in condensed matter physics. We take space to be not R3, but R times a two-sphere, or it could be R times a two-torus. In other words, we could take periodic boundary conditions in two directions, or three directions. But what's important is that two directions will be compact. And we take the topological insulator, filling S2 times a half line. R plus is half of R. So I've drawn this schematically. R runs horizontally, S2 runs vertically, and the blue is meant to be the part of space that's filled by the topological insulator. And now I include time, so space-time is another R that parameterizes time, times R times S2. We put one unit of magnetic flux on S2, and we choose a localized electric field. Oh, sorry, there should be no plus here, I'm sorry. On the product, on the first factor, R time times R, we place a localized electric field, <coughs> which has, so to speak, one unit of electric flux. So the electric field is non-zero only in a small span of space and time, and its integral is one unit. Or you could go to uh, Euclidean signature, and then you would have called this one unit of magnetic flux. But overall, as long as we integrate over all of space-time to give what I'll call p hat, this gives an instanton that is a field with instanton number one. So that's, a, that's at least as a thought experiment an instanton in condensed matter physics. Now, I took here an integral over all of space-time in contrast to p, which is only an integral over the world volume of the insulator. So, in all of space-time, we had a localized instanton that has instanton number one. So it makes sense, since the instanton is localized, it makes sense for it to be far outside the material or deep inside. So P is a topological invariant, but P hat is not. P hat is always one, but P will be zero if the instanton is far outside the material and one if the instanton is deep inside. So naively, theta being pi means the partition function should be negative if the instanton is far inside. 
So the claim that theta is zero outside and pi inside ought to mean that the path integral measure is positive when the instant time is outside x and negative when it's inside. But T symmetry does not let us interpolate from positive to negative values through, for example, numbers of comp modulus one. We can't interpolate from positive to negative on the unit circle in a T-conserving theory. But this, fa this answer that I'm claiming has the right properties. It's real when the instant on is far outside, z psi is positive and iota is zero. But if the instant on is deep inside, iota is one and z psi is still positive. The factor z psi times minus one to the iota varies smoothly from positive to negative values since according to the atiyah padoti singer theorem, iota jumps precisely at the point when z psi vanishes. So part of their theorem tells us that this function is smooth. Finally, a very brief explanation of the theorem. It's an index theorem for the Dirac operator on a four manifold with boundary. The four dimensional Dirac operator commutes with the chirality operator. This should be a four here, by the way. It commutes with the chirality operator. So a consequence is that if psi is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda, then gamma five psi has eigenvalue minus lambda simply because gamma five anti-commutes with, with the Dirac operator. That if lambda isn't zero, psi and gamma five psi have different eigenvalues, so they must be linearly independent. So we can form combinations of definite chirality, but they have the same eigenvalue for what I'll call the Hamiltonian, the square of the Dirac operator. <coughs> so at any eigenvalue except zero, the Hamiltonian has equally many eigenvalues of positive or negative chirality. But among zero modes of H, this argument doesn't work, and there can be a chiral asymmetry. The step where I said that psi and gamma five psi are linearly independent assumed that lambda was not zero. So for zero eigenvalues, that's not true, and there can be a chiral asymmetry. So we let n plus and n minus be the dimensions of the space of zero modes of H of positive or negative chirality, and the index is defined as n plus minus n minus. It's a topological invariant because of arguments that are actually used all the time in discussing topological states of matter. Basically, when eigenvalues of H move to or from zero energy, they have to do so in pairs consisting of two states of opposite chirality, which will then cancel out of this difference. Now, the usual Atiyah Singer index theorem gives a formula for the index, which is A roof minus P, where P is the U1 instanton number, and A roof is something that only involves gravity. But Atiyah, Padoti, and Singer wanted an index theorem for four manifold width boundary. And that's tricky because there isn't an obvious boundary condition you can use. The Dirac operator has an elementary boundary condition that we discussed last time, that the normal part of the gamma matrices on psi gives plus or minus psi. But the gap, that would not, that boundary condition violates chirality and would not let us define an index. So Atiyah, Patoti, and Singer found a boundary condition that enabled them to define an index, but the boundary condition was a funny one that involved fermions on the boundary. And their theorem says that iota, the index with their boundary condition, is a roof minus p minus a half eta, which is the formula I used a few moments ago. So the iota in the effective action of a topological insulator is the index of the Dirac operator with APS boundary conditions. So now I want to explain this in reverse. So I explain this starting from the boundary, where we assumed that for some reason there was supposed to be a drog fermion on the boundary, and we had trouble. And we eventually canceled the trouble by assuming the bulk was funny, and then we needed this funny APS theorem, and then we got a sensible answer. 
but we'll, much more briefly, I'll explain the story starting with the bulk. So I would say that in four dimensions, there's a 4D topological quantum field theory with U1 symmetry, with the property that its partition function on a closed four manifold coupled to a U1 gauge field A is minus one to the iota. So on rather general grounds, using cobordism invariance, you can show that there is a 4D partition function, sorry, a 4D TQFT with that partition function, but I also will give you a down-to-earth explanation in a few minutes in this special case. So that's the partition function on a manifold without boundary, but it's hard to make sense of this on a manifold with boundary. As I told you, it's hard to define iota on a manifold with boundary because there's no simple boundary condition on the Dirac equation that enables you to define the index iota. With APS boundary conditions, you can define the index, but it's not a topological invariant. The reason is that I didn't quite tell you the APS boundary conditions, but these boundary conditions change discontinuously when the Dirac zero mode chain, uh, passes, when a Dirac eigenvalue passes through zero on the boundary. So iota jumps by plus or minus one when an eigenvalue of the Dirac operator on the boundary passes through zero. So minus one to the iota, where iota is defined with APS boundary conditions, would not be a partition function of a topological field theory by itself and wouldn't make physical sense. The theory whose partition function on a closed four manifold is minus one to the iota does not have an elementary gap symmetry-preserving boundary state. But it does have a gapless symmetry-preserving boundary state with the emphasis on gapless with 2D, <coughs> 2 plus 1D massless Dirac fermions on the boundary such that the partition function is this product. From this point of view, minus one to the iota had unphysical changes of sign and the role of the fermions is to give a physically sensible interpretation to those changes of sign. That's the way I explained it at the beginning. I said the partition function of the fermion should have changes of sign, and to get them, we introduced iota. So if I've been clear, then it would also have been clear that I said the same thing twice, more or less, but much faster the second time. But there's a question that might, might puzzle you. What is a theory with partition function minus one to the iota have to do with any other definition you've heard of of a 3D topological insulator. So I could give a technical explanation, but I want to give instead a more physical one. We'll use something we learned last week. The phase transition between a trivial 3D insulator and a topological one occurs when the mass M of a charged rock fermion passes through zero. In three plus one dimensions, it, without a lot of tricky symmetries, it's non-generic to have a massless Dirac fermion, but with time reversal symmetry, it's natural to vary one parameter and have the mass pass through zero. And that's the phase transition between a trivial and a non-trivial T-conserving insulator. That's part of what we learned last week. Now, to proceed for simplicity, let's assume that iota is positive so generically, there are iota zero modes of psi plus, which is the positive chirality part of psi, and their charge conjugates are iota zero modes of psi bar minus. And at m equals zero, the partition function, whenever iota is positive, vanishes because of these two iota zero modes. But it will not vanish when the mass is not zero. The action contains a mass term so the path integral has a lot of stuff, but there's an m times psi bar minus psi plus. And if there are zero modes, meaning modes that are annihilated by what I didn't write, the kinetic energy, then to soak them up, you need to use the mass term. So you expand in powers of m, and you need iota powers of m to lift all these zero modes. So then you find that z is proportional to m to the iota, with one factor of m for each pair of zero modes. So if the path integral is positive for positive m, then for negative m, the sign of the path integral is the sign of m to the iota. In other words, the sign of the path integral is minus one to the iota. So it follows from standard characterizations of a topological insulator that the bulk 
is described by a topological quantum field theory whose partition function in the presence of a background gauge field on some manifold is minus one to the iota. So you'll perhaps be relieved that that completes what I'll say about the 3D topological insulator. Now, oh, sorry. Okay. I'm going to have to uh, decide as I go on just how much to cut short what I was planning. But since I was afraid this might happen, I am planning now to give a preview or overview of the more subtle cases without any technical details. <clears throat> so the other cases concern real or complex fermions. And I remind you that my prototypes with the a 2D time reversal invariant topological insulator or superconductor, or a 3D topological insulator or superconductor where we work on possibly unor unorientable manifolds. So actually, this is what I just said. So in each case, there's an invariant analogous to iota, and there's a d plus one dimensional TQFT whose partition function is the exponential of this invariant. In each case, the invariant in question cannot be defined as a topological invariant on a manifold with boundary. For real fermions, the invariant is the mod two index of the Dirac operator, which I will call zeta. And for complex invariants, sorry, complex fermions, the relevant invariant is an eta invariant again, but now an eta invariant in d plus one dimensions instead of d dimensions. The partition function of the d plus one dimensional theory is minus one to the zeta or e to the i pi eta in the two cases. As I've said, just like minus one to the iota, these other invariants cannot be defined as topological invariants on a manifold with boundary. So the topological field theory that has one of these partition functions does not have a trivial gapless boundary state. So massless fermions on the boundary or something more sophisticated are needed to define one of these theories on a manifold with boundary. Although none of these are well-defined on manifolds with boundary as topological invariants, when we add the standard gapless fermions that exist on the boundaries of these systems, these products are all well-defined and physically sensible. In each case, iota, zeta, and eta are defined using APS boundary conditions. Now, just as in the example we've already discussed, the fact that only the product of the fermion path integral and the partition function of the bulk TQFT is well-defined means the fermions are not consistent by themselves. The fermion theory is anomalous. In the case that involves the eta invariant, an explicit computation illustrating the anomaly was done in this paper. Now, I've got a few more comments. First, the fact that the partition function of a 2 plus 1D or a 3 plus 1D topological whatever is what I've claimed can be proved the same way I argued for minus 1 to the iota in the case of a 3D topological insulator. There always are standard descriptions relating the trivial phase to the non-trivial phase by going through a phase transition when a bulk massive field has a change in sign of its mass. So there's always a Starting with the trivial phase, you look at the sign or phase the path integral acquires when an appropriate fermion mass term passes through zero. So I did the computation, gave minus one to the iota, and similar computations give these two. Now, the formulas with minus one to the iota and minus one to the zeta can be viewed as special cases of the general formula involving eta, because eta is a rather fancy invariant in general, but it collapses to iota or zeta for pseudo-real or real fermions. But as I said at the beginning, I didn't want to start that way because it would have made the lecture too abstract. The formula with e to the i pi eta is the universal one. <clears throat> the formula with e to the i pi eta can also be applied to better understood cases such as the quantum Hall effect or it will mostly reproduce what's known in the literature. 
uh, the point of my lecture has been to explain subtler cases involving discrete anomalies for fermions where more familiar methods might not be adequate. Another point is that the various formulas are all elaborations on work on global anomalies going back to the 1980s. <coughs> so, okay, the preview only took five minutes, so we actually still do have a little bit of time. Without even running over, we still have 10 minutes, so. So you will get to hear at least some details. Yes? Uh, so there is a minus one in IOTA. Yes. 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 The others are not as elementary. The, the reason that in the literature it's been discovered, theta equals pi for the 3D topological insulator, and the other ones haven't really been discovered, is that their meaning is less elementary. So they, they aren't integrals. If they had been integral, the reason I started with minus one to the iota was precisely that I could write down integral expressions that you'd recognize. We had to use the APS theorem that might be unfamiliar, but at least most of the formulas were more familiar. So for real fermions, for example, a T invariant 2 plus 1D topological superconductor, well, the boundary fermions are non-chiral real fermions in dimension 1 plus 1. The first step is to define the mod 2 index of the Dirac operator. For physicists, I think the simplest explanation is this. Suppose we have a fermion theory in D dimensions. I don't care what it is. All I care is that there's some action with some curly D as the kinetic operator. Well, by Fermi statistics, D is anti-symmetric. That's actually the only general property it has. In Euclidean signature, it has no reality or hermeticity properties in general, but is always anti-symmetric by Fermi statistics. The canonical form of an anti-symmetric matrix is block diagonal with non-degenerate two by two blocks and some zero modes. I drew a case with three zero modes. The number of zero modes is a topological invariant mod two because the only way that the number of zero, how could we increase the number of zero modes? Well, we could take A to zero or B to zero, but that would increase the number of zero modes by two. Similarly, we could reduce the number of zero modes by two. But the number of zero modes is a topological invariant mod two. So the number of zero modes mod two is a Z2 value topological invariant that I'll call zeta. It's called the mod two index of the Dirac operator. I want to stress that it's not the mod two reduction of an integer valued invariant like an ordinary index. For example, in dimension three, there's no ordinary index, but there is a non-trivial mod two index. So the mod two index was defined by Atiyah and Singer as part of their work on index theory. To physicists, it's not as familiar as the basic integer valued index, but it's definitely not a mod two reduction of an ordinary index. Now, the example of the mod two index that's relevant to the uh, 2D topological superconductor, oh, sorry, yeah, is a Majorana fermion in three dimensions. It certainly has a Dirac index, so the 3D Dirac operator has a mod two index zeta. On an orientable three manifold, this mod two index is always zero because of a version of Cromer's doubling. You can use an anti-unitary operation to pair modes and prove that the mod two index vanishes in an orientable three manifold. But the mod two index is in general not zero on an unorientable three manifold. For example, on S1 times K, where K is a Klein bottle, the mod two index is not zero. So it's a non-trivial invariant, but you'll have to go to an unorientable manifold to see it. This is, you're assuming time reversal? I'm a, we are only discussing time reversal conserving theory so that it makes physical sense to work on an unorientable manifold. I think if, it, if you don't have time reversal, you just have one copy of things, you still have some mod two difference in there. Uh, in two dimensions, there's a mod two index. Yeah. Uh, not in two plus one, in, in one plus one dimensions, there's a mod two index on an orientable Riemann surface. I wasn't going to explain it, but it's actually a true fact, well, it's a true fact, but we won't use it, so I won't explain it. The, to keep the lecture as short as I can, 
the only example, non-trivial example of the model two index I'll use is this one. So there's a 3D TQFT whose partition function on a closed three manifold is minus one to the zeta. So its partition function is plus one on any orientable three manifold, but it's minus one on some unorientable ones. But as I've indicated, this invariant can't be defined as a topological invariant on a manifold with boundary. Anticipating that the problem can be cured by coupling to massless Majorana fermions on the boundary, let's discuss the path integral for d equals two, that is one plus one dimensional massless Majorana fermions. In two dimensions, we only need two gamma matrices, so we can pick them to be real two by two matrices. This is an Euclidean signature. So gamma one and gamma two are two by two real symmetric matrices. So the Dirac operator is real and anti-symmetric. The Hermitian Dirac operator is imaginary and anti-symmetric. Such an operator has equal and opposite eigenvalues because if d psi equals lambda psi, then d of the complex conjugate of psi is minus lambda times the complex conjugate of psi. So there's a doubling of eigenvalues or a pairing between lambda and minus lambda as long as lambda isn't zero. If lambda is zero, there isn't any pairing for, for this reason. Actually, that's a way of seeing a mod two index in two dimensions, but not in exactly the case you mentioned. On an orientable two manifold, there's a further doubling because of a version of Cromer's doubling. We, we take the two dimensional chirality operator and now we have an anti-unitary operation that squares to minus one. It's psi going to gamma bar psi star. It commutes with the Dirac operator, so all eigenvalues have even multiplicity. But on an, <coughs> because of T and R invariants, it makes sense to define the 2D Majorana fermion on a possibly unorientable two manifold. But in that case, we can't define gamma bar and there's no Cromer's doubling. Now, the path integral of a Majorana fermion is best understood as the Fafian not determinant of the anti-symmetric Dirac operator. So an anti-symmetric matrix has a canonical form like so, where the lambdas are uniquely determined only up to sign, because exchanging the first two rows and columns would change the sign of lambda one. And the Fafian up to sign is the product of the lambdas, where I allow for the fact that the lambdas are defined up to sign. Now, in any system of real fermions, the Fafian is naturally real, but there can be an anomaly in its sign because of an odd number of pairs of eigenvalues passing through zero as one goes around the loop in the space of fields. The picture is a little bit like one I drew for pseudo-real fermions, but now instead of a net upwards or downwards flow, there's a symmetry of the spectrum around zero, and we're interested in counting mod two how many crossings pass through zero. So I've drawn a spectrum that leads to an anomaly. <clears throat> On an orientable manifold, Cromer's doubling keeps this from happening because all eigenvalues are doubled. So on an orientable manifold, there's no anomaly and moreover, it's natural to define the Fafian to be positive. On an unorientable manifold, there's no Cromer's doubling and there can be an anomaly. So the 2D Majorana fermion is inconsistent on an unorientable two manifold. By now you hopefully know what I'm going to say. There's no way to define the 2D Majorana fermion on a bare, possibly unorientable two manifold. But the 2D Majorana fermion can exist on a 2D manifold M that's the boundary of a 3D manifold X that supports a T invariant topological superconductor. The partition function is the Fafian of the Dirac operator times minus one to the zeta. So that's the path integral of the boundary Majorana fermion times the bulk TQFT on a 3D manifold that might have a boundary. And it's physically sensible much as the example in three plus one dimensions was physically sensible. Now, in view of the time, I'll be extremely brief for the case of a topological superconductor whose world volume dimension is four. 
want an orientable four manifold, we discussed its partition function, and essentially we did this insulator, but also for the superconductor, the partition function would be minus one to the iota. Where iota is an index of a suitable Dirac operator. And the proof is the same as before. You consider a phase transition where a mass passes through zero. You can determine the answer the same way on a general unorientable form manifold, but the answer can be no longer expressed in terms of an index or a mod two index. Rather, the answer is e to the i pi eta. So uh, there won't be time, but by making use of essentially things I've already told you, we could deduce that the phase transition from the topological to the non-topological insulator changes the partition function by this factor. This is a formula that was guessed on the basis of cobordism invariance. Kopustin et al. just observed that cobordism invariants are one way to find topological field theories. So they guessed that the topological insulator um, might have this partition function, but I'm telling you that you can prove it by considering the phase transition when a mass changes sign. Yes, yes, the eight invariant of the Dirac operator, <clears throat> coupled to a Majoran of fermion. Now, one reason I will not go into any detail is that, see, it would take some explanation of this property, but in even dimensions, the APS index theorem shows that eta is a topological invariant and even a cobordism invariant, and in D equals four, you can show that e to the i pi eta is in general an arbitrary 16th root of one. So th there is a non, on four manifolds without boundary, there's a non-trivial TQFT with partition function e to the i pi eta, but the 16th power of that TQFT is trivial. So there are 16 classes of superconductor with the partition function being the nth power of this, wh where nu is an integer mod 16. So you know the story by now, e to the i pi eta is not a topological invariant if there's a boundary. Likewise, the path integral of Majoran of fermions on the boundary is anomalous. Moreover, in contrast to the other examples I've given, the anomaly in the Majoran of fermion path integral in three dimensions in the unorientable case is not simply a sign. It involves the eta invariant, not the more simple invariants iota or zeta, by reasoning that goes back to work I did a long time ago, and was elaborated in what I like to call the die fried theorem. And these are tools that are also important in string theory. So the upshot, as you should guess from what I've said, is that the product is well-defined and physically sensible, and I claim that that's the partition function of a 4D topological insulator on a possibly unorientable four manifold with the massless Majoran of fermions on the boundary. Now, of course, unfortunately, it's a slightly fanciful situation for condensed matter physics. We're not going to be, well, <laughs> we can't even get to curve three manifolds, really, let alone curve four manifolds. But I hope this conceptual explanation maybe sheds light on some more down-to-earth questions. Thank you.